You know, Gary um, said that uh, I didn't need to be here, but I don't think he meant that. I really do need to be here. Um, I met Gary, um, I've known Gary for some time, but we really uh, had a chance to discuss uh, sickle cell issues uh, last year when he presented at the uh, second drug development uh, conference in New York. And, you know, I've been affiliated with um, Sickle Cell Disease Association of America uh, since, I think, 1985. And I must say that I just didn't think I'd heard any of our leaders around the country uh, express so passionately and so forcefully the needs uh, of people with sickle cell disease as Gary did that day. I think that the company's uh, representatives who were at the meeting were all very impressed by his message. And so Gary, to me, is a privilege to join you here uh, today to uh, try to contribute a little bit uh, to the amazing work that you're doing here. Um, I am uh, in the spirit of so hope uh, on the horizon. I'm going to devote some time uh, to talk about uh, fulfilling this hope uh, for many people affected with this disease. And I add it uh, everywhere because, as you know, as much as uh, we devote uh, some of our energy and resources to sickle cell disease work here in, in the United States, uh, the disease is more common, uh, bigger, and probably has a greater public health uh, impact uh, in many other parts of the world, especially uh, in, in Africa, uh, where I was born and where I'm still from. What did I do? Okay. All right. So here is a newborn baby born in 2014 goes and lives in part of the world where there is newborn screening. <coughs> and uh, the newborn screening uh, shows these results, FS, which is interpreted on confirmation uh, to be SS. And the baby at, at birth is a well baby, as all babies born with sickle cell disease are at birth. And just a little quote from a father in Ghana, uh, where we have a small newborn screening project underway. Uh, when this father was told that the newborn had sickle cell disease and began to describe some of the things that the baby uh, would have as the baby grew, his response was that you put a curse on my baby. Um, and what he meant was, this baby doesn't look sick, and you're telling me all these bad things that can happen to this baby. And if you're not going to do something to prevent those bad things, it means you wish uh, badly for my child, you're putting a curse on my baby. A question that most uh, parents who are introduced um, to this topic and their baby uh, ask is how long will my baby live? If they don't know anything at all about sickle cell disease, uh, they know that this is a disease that can shorten life. And a follow-up question that often comes see if I, is whether we can keep the baby. Uh, well, and I'll keep coming back uh, to these uh, two questions as we move along. So I want to say a little bit about um, some of the, um, the problems that we see in uh, sickle cell disease. Um, you know, I can't see this very well because I'm so parallel to it. Um, maybe I need to step off. Can I pull this off and... Great. So I hope you, hope you don't mind. <laughs> I'm going to be a preacher. <laughs> so I want to talk about mortality uh, in sickle cell disease first. That's the first question that the parent asked. Uh, talk about some of the major problems uh, very briefly in sickle cell disease. Then go back to the, 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 the theme of hope uh, for wellness, the idea that certainly uh, prevention is better than cure by reviewing some of the progress that we've made. Uh, talk about some of the interventions that have made a difference uh, in the lives of people. And at the end, talk about these three uh, interventions in particular, uh, red cell transfusion, hydroxyurea, and blood stem cell. Not in any detail because experts are going to speak on that. And then appeal at the end that we need to change the way that we approach the care of sickle cell patients. 
So an ob observation that anybody uh, who has been around uh, working in this disease uh, can make is that we have learned a lot about the sickle cell disease. And there is a lot that we can do for people with this condition. Um, but my feeling is that we're not doing enough. So we know that sickle cell disease uh, is a disease that has sort of two main uh, problems. One is that most people affected with sickle cell disease, particularly the severe forms, have anemia. Often we accept the anemia as if it's the background to the disease, rather than actually looking at the anemia as the cause of many of the problems that we have. So we don't really have a plan most of the time to deal with the anemia of sickle cell disease. And then we know that uh, these abnormal uh, red blood cells cause blockage of blood flow uh, to different parts of the body. And the effects of these are that we know there are some complications, some acute and some chronic that deal with, uh, that are because of the uh, anemia. We know that there is acute organ damage uh, in, in sickle cell disease. We don't think of pain uh, attacks as organ damage, but actually there is a, the, it is um, a form of organ tissue damage that causes that much pain. We know that over time, uh, many organs uh, in people with sickle cell conditions become damaged. And overall, we know that there is decreased uh, uh, life expectancy or increased mortality in people with sickle cell disease. So if we were going to answer this question uh, to the mother about the baby, we know that we would have to carefully uh, make some guess as to what the life expectancy of this baby might be. So the baby at birth who was healthy then faces the first year of life uh, one of the things that we notice very quickly is that the baby hemoglobin, hemoglobin F, that actually protects the baby from being sick at birth, uh, begins to decline. And so now the baby's uh, blood is changing to become the type that has more of the effect of sickle cell disease in it. And we sort of just watch it happen. Uh, the child becomes even more and more anemic. And we, uh, the first organ that we lose in children with sickle cell disease is the spleen. Uh, this exposes the child to a life uh, time of increased risks from severe infection. And then uh, the baby begins to become introduced to pain. Uh, and the first pain episode that we tend to see in children with sickle cell disease is the so-called Hanford syndrome. So all of these changes are taking place in the first year of life. And outside the United States, as particularly shown in uh, Jamaica and elsewhere, the second half of the first year, from six months to 12 months, has the highest mortality uh, in sickle cell disease. So in one year, we go from an otherwise healthy baby born at birth. We notice all of these changes going on, all of them pointing to a worsening situation. And then in the second half of the first year, the child actually faces a great danger of not surviving. Beyond the first year, things don't get better. Um, things continue to get worse. Uh, it clearly established uh, chronic hemolytic anemia, very low hemoglobins. Uh, we know the baby then lives in a chronic inflammatory state. Some of it we are aware of because the child gets sick from time to time much of it actually happening in the background and destroying organs. The spleen eventually gets completely lost. And then a lack of enough oxygen to tissues causes damage to uh, small and large blood vessels over time. So if we go back to try to address the first question, how long will my baby live? How can we assure this mother? Well, how do we actually know how bad sickle cell disease is? In this country, if you have sickle cell disease right from birth, you are actually started on treatment of some sort. Uh, so depending upon where you live in the world, this question of how long will my baby live uh, may or may not be answered easily. What happens when people with sickle cell disease are not diagnosed or treated? Many of us here have never seen that situation and hope we'll never do so. Well, there was a study uh, conducted in Nigeria uh, in the 1970s. It did not start out as a study of sickle cell disease. It's actually a malaria study, but there was an opportunity uh, for the scientists to get a feel for what happens uh, to um, people born with sickle cell disease. 
So there are a few numbers uh, here, and I'm guessing, is this a pointer also? Whoops, nope. Um, but if you look, at, this is um, a test, you know, we talk about newborn screening here in America. Uh, but there have been uh, t uh, testing of newborns uh, in different parts of the world in small degrees. So in this particular area uh, called uh, Zaki in northern Nigeria, this is the area where Abuja, uh, the, the new capital of Nigeria, is located. Uh, these scientists were testing large numbers of people in a rural area, uh, mostly interested in how often people get malaria, but it was an opportunity also to find out how many people in the, in the community had sickle cell trait or hemoglobin C trait because it was known to protect uh, children uh, from severe malaria. So they tested uh, about 530 uh, babies, and based on testing the grown-ups uh, in that population, mathematically, they were able to estimate how many babies should be born with sickle cell disease, just statistically. Uh, so they had predicted, um, they, had, they expected, that there will be about 11.5 babies, that's about 12 babies born with sickle cell disease in this community. And 11 babies were actually born with sickle cell disease. So very, very close. So you can at least say that in this population, you know what to expect in terms of numbers of babies being born. Then the main survey was done in about 3,000 uh, people to see the types of hemoglobins that they had and then to compare what they saw with what could be expected. So for the children who were tested under one year of age, they expected uh, mathematically about 1.5 babies. Of course, there are no 0.5 babies. Um, but they observed two babies were born with sickle cell disease, uh, were, had sickle cell disease in the under one population. They expected that they would see about six children with SS in those one to four years of age. There was one in the population. They expected to see about 12 uh, children uh, between five and nine uh, with sickle cell disease SS. There was none. And they expected to see about 40 uh, above nine uh, years of age um, with SS, and there was only one. So out of an expected uh, number of about 60, children, uh, 60 people with sickle cell disease in that population, they only found four. Now, this could only be interpreted uh, to mean one thing. And they estimated that less than 2% of uh, the expected number of people with sickle cell disease were alive past five years of age in that population, meaning that 98% had died by five years of age. So this is what you could say happens to people with sickle cell disease where they're not diagnosed or treated. Now, this is in Nigeria. If you extrapolated this over the whole country of Nigeria, where 150,000 babies are born each year with sickle cell disease, you can understand the impact of sickle cell disease when it's not diagnosed and where there's no treatment. Of course, that's not the situation here in this country. We've known for a long time, since the 50s and 60s, that sickle cell disease has especially heavy toll uh, on young people, uh, young children with sickle cell disease. Uh, but these numbers didn't come together until some well-organized studies uh, were conducted here in the United States. And these mortality information came from the cooperative study of sickle cell disease uh, which is a study, the largest clinical study done here in the United States that had close to 4,000 uh, patients. Among the patients who were registered in the study were about 560 who were diagnosed as newborns and followed for uh, at least 15 years in the study. And they provided us information on uh, exactly the situation in this country in the 70s, late 70s, and mostly in the 80s. And there's a, a lot of numbers here, but I just want to point out uh, some. The first section deals with all of the, pay, uh, the children uh, in the study uh, who, uh, whose information was used for these mortality estimates. And then the lower portion deals with those with SS, the more severe form. And if in the blue box, uh, you have those, all of those under 20 years of age were considered pediatric, and uh, their information was used for this than those under a year of age and those between one and three is what I've highlighted. Uh, sometimes it's hard to understand these sort of numbers or to at least uh, uh, interpret them for the population. So for instance, for all the sickle cell patients, it says here 
The last column says 0 0.50. That's the incidence of death in 100 person years. That means if you follow 200 people under 20 years of age with sickle cell disease, you will lose one a year. That translates to 0.5 per 100 person years. 200 people followed for one year, you lose one. But look at uh, between one and three years of age, the number goes to 1.66. That's almost four times what you would see for the entire population, meaning that those under, um, at least here, under three years of age or under four years of age, the mortality rate is much higher. So you can see from these numbers that the first three years of life, and the numbers go down after that, face the highest mortality. And then if you select the SS patients, the numbers go even higher. So that's just to show that even here in the United States, in the 70s and 80s, the first three years of life uh, were the most uh, dangerous as far as death for children goes. And the study established the leading causes of death uh, in this uh, pie chart. Uh, the blue part is infection. Uh, the study said that more than half the children who died uh, at, uh, in the first 10 years of life died from infection. And then there's stroke, uh, splenic sequestration in the red pie. Uh, these numbers uh, have changed quite a bit now in America uh, because we have done quite a bit to try to decrease uh, the rate as we will see. So uh, from the same study also, there was information about the grown-ups, not just the children, but uh, the grown-ups. And there, the causes of death were also uh, uh, shown. And it's surprising to most of us that in the adult patients, the leading circumstances of death, they're sort of different from, say, cause. A cause means you really establish a cause of death. And many times we're not able to establish it, but at least we know the circumstances under which somebody's uh, illness was being managed in the hospital. So for the adults in that study, the leading circumstance of death was uncomplicated pain. Now, almost all of us as hematologists will say that we don't think pain itself causes death in sickle cell disease, but here the numbers show it. Then pain uh, in association with acute chest uh, syndrome was sort of second. And the numbers would go down there. ACS is acute chest syndrome, stroke, um, and those who had uh, some operations. But at least you see how it shifted from infection in the very young children to these circumstances uh, that unfortunately still exist. And then those who have chronic uh, disease at the time, we know that kidney failure, heart failure contributed to, uh, to death. So in the question about um, how my, long my baby will live, we have a sense of where the problem exists and what we might do uh, to save it. But death is not the only question that this mother asked about. Wanted to know whether we've made any progress uh, first in the death. And where do we stand today as far as making these babies survive from losing 98% in Nigeria uh, to now how many babies do we expect to lose in America here in a year? Uh, this study came from our colleagues um, uh, in, in uh, Dallas, uh, published by Charles Quinn, who is now in uh, Cincinnati. And it showed that the survival of young children with sickle cell disease has improved here in America. And here is a list of, uh, in there, this is all a series of patients who were newborn screened and placed on penicillin prophylaxis in the program uh, in Dallas. And the, the bottom line in yellow says that the incidence of death are uh, now at 0.5 deaths per 100 patient years for SS. If you remember the um, numbers that I showed you before for the SS patients, the death rate was higher than this, but this has improved quite a bit. This now for SS patients means that you lose one per 200 rather than for all the types of sickle cell disease patients. So some improvement, but still certainly uh, far higher than normal. And the causes of death, even though we had decreased the infection uh, a lot, 
Um, now the leading cause being acute chest syndrome and the multi-organ uh, failure, but pneumococcal sepsis, which is what we fight with penicillin prophylaxis, uh, was still uh, there in that number. Interesting uh, set of uh, graphs here, it sort of compares the large studies that had been conducted in different parts of the world as to what is happening as far as losing uh, uh, children with sickle cell disease. Now, the way these curves are, uh, on the y-axis is a fraction surviving. So 1.0 at the top actually means 100%. So if you stay on that line, it means that there was no death. The lower the line drops, means you are losing people. Fewer people are surviving. So in this series, the bottom is Jamaica from 1973 to 75. This is when the Jamaican cohort study uh, was just starting. And at the bottom is that somewhere around maybe 72, 74% of uh, people with sickle cell disease were surviving by 18 years of age, okay? And the number keeps getting better and better. And the top is from the Dallas uh, report and that show that other than losing maybe one or so two children in the first two years of life, the line sort of remained flat, very close to 100%. So now you have about 96, 97% of the children surviving the first 18 years. That's tremendous progress. This is way short of a cure for the disease, but some interventions are making these children survive. And then you see the, the middle group. So one can probably begin to assure this mother that at least for the first 20 years or so of life, death is not a major issue. 40 years ago, 50 years ago, we used to say that only half the children will live past 20 years of age. But here now we're looking at more than 95%. So what accounts for this decrease in mortality? We know that early diagnosis as a newborn screening helps, but it's not just a diagnosis, we have to intervene. Infection prevention and management is probably what has made the biggest difference in children surviving penicillin prophylaxis. The vaccines that we can give now against uh, the most dangerous germ, uh, pneumococcus. And also the way doctors and nurses and hospitals have organized themselves to take care of children with sickle cell disease. A child with sickle cell disease who has just an ordinary fever is an emergency. Uh, this aggressive approach towards making sure that these children don't die from infection uh, ha have, have really uh, has made a, a big difference. And then just having comprehensive care, having an organized care where well-established clinics follow these patients and begin to anticipate problems that they would have and manage them before they become uh, major life-threatening uh, issues have all helped to decrease the mortality. These are not expensive interventions. They're relatively simple and, in my mind, affordable uh, in almost every country. So short of uh, a real cure, we've made some progress. Now, we come to adults. Can we expect the same sort of outcome as we've seen in the children? This is a summary uh, that was published uh, just last year by Sophie Langstrom at um, Hopkins. And the big numbers here, some of you may remember that for the last oh, maybe 20 years or so, we had some figures from the cooperative study of sickle cell disease that says that for adults uh, uh, with SS, that the median life expectancy is 42 years for men and 48 years for women. Now that means that by 42 years of age, we would have lost half the people with, uh, half the men with sickle cell disease SS and half would still be living. And for the women, that goes to about 48 years before we would have lost half. So just keep those numbers in your mind. 42 for the men, 48 for the women. That was reported um, for, on patients living in the 1980s. Now here we are. Uh, in, in now information that goes from 1979 to 2005, reported uh, through the National Center for Health Statistics, collecting information from all the, um, um, the states uh, in the country. Look at the mean age at death. This is the average 
age when somebody dies. That's different from when half of them are gone. For men, it's 33 years. And for women, it's 30, almost 37 years. That's not very high. That is not really very high, and it's surprisingly low. So we are saving all these children, letting them reach 20 years of age, but we're not pushing past some limits. Now look at the median age. For the men, I said it was 42 for those living in the 80s. It's dropped to 38. And for the women, it used to be 48, and that has dropped to 42. The overall mortality for people more than 19 years of age with sickle cell disease in this country has increased by 1% every year from 1979 to 2005. So the progress we've made in children, we're actually losing ground in adults surviving. So the interventions that we were able to put together to save the lives of young children, we're not able to do similar things to prevent the older patients from dying. But before death, uh, people with sickle cell disease face many other problems, as we know. I'm trying to move forward, I'm not sure where to point this. Uh, in the uh, cooperative study of sickle cell disease, sorry, um, the study looked at uh, young children in the first five years, then in the first 10 years uh, to see what problems uh, children were having. And it tracked dactylitis or the hand foot syndrome, pain, acute chest, and stroke. And it's looking at the different age groups. The yellow uh, numbers are for those with SS. The green numbers are for those with SC. If you just track each of those uh, issues, say dactylitis, from less than six months of age all the way, uh, you see that hand foot syndrome is a problem that begins to increase in the first few years of life. And then by six, five years of age, it seems to have disappeared. And we know that. It's a common thing in very young children, but not often. But pain itself, pain attacks, begin to increase from a very early age and then continue to increase. The numbers that you see mean that, say, for the five-year-old under pain, it says 40.8. What does that mean? It says per 100 patient years. Again, if you took 100 uh, patients and you follow them for one year, about 41 of them will have a pain episode. That's the easiest way to understand it. So almost half the children over a period of, year, uh, of a year would have had a pain episode. That is very common. Um, even though we sort of uh, think that one pain episode or two epi episodes is, is, is not so high, the idea that you can live a life where you can expect to have frequent occurring episodes of severe pain, and that is the way your life is going to be, should not be acceptable to anybody, okay? Um, even those whose careers, like athletes, uh, have the risk of pain, don't go through this kind of pain several times a year and for it to be acceptable, as that's the way you are. Acute chest, the pneumonia-like illness that we see continue to increase. About a quarter of the patients would face acute chest um, in, in, in a year. Uh, stroke also begins to increase, especially in the children between two and five years of age. So aside from death, patients are not living comfortably. They are going through many episodes of severe illness. This now looks at even a longer period of time. The first figures I showed you were for children. This study conducted in Los Angeles and uh, followed by Darlene Powers, uh, who for many years followed a large number of patients, in this case over 1,000 patients. Uh, give us some information about what adults uh, go through or how the disease manifests itself as patients get older. Uh, the first um, column there is listing the acute events and there's hospitalization for sickle cell related problems and for pain alone. 
and look at the numbers uh, of people who had the event and then the percentage of the patients who had the event. So for instance, for hospitalization, it says 76% of the patients had some admission to the hospital um, during the period of the, of the study. Uh, I mean, per year, this is on 100 patients per year. So if you followed 100 patients, 76% of, of them would have a hospitalization. 70% of them would have hospitalization for pain. 50% of them would have some admission related to a uh, crisis, and about half of them will have acute chest. And it goes through many other complications. Again, this is just to show us that even when they are not dying, it doesn't mean the patients are living healthy lives. They're going through a lot of uh, illness. So to come back to the mother's question, can you keep my baby well? Are there some things we can do that actually can maintain wellness for patients now that they're living? And clearly, if you look at the adult figures, you could say that we're not doing enough. But we know that some interventions are changing the clinical course of this disease. They're keeping some patients in better health, and they're prolonging the lives of some patients. So what it is that we can do that can give us a hope uh, for wellness. So here are some interventions. We are familiar with the, those in white, newborn screening, comprehensive care coordination, and family education, because that is also important. But there are three tools we have now, and you hear more about them, that seem to address sickle cell disease from a, view, a viewpoint similar to what we did with infection with penicillin prophylaxis. There's hydroxyurea, uh, in this country it's affordable. Its, it's use is increasing. There is chronic transfusion therapy, and then there is bone marrow transplantation, or here in a more fancy terminology, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, which we are only using to a very limited basis. But these three interventions do not address specific complications of the disease as much as addressing fundamentally the nature of the disease with the potential to change the course of health and, and luckily also prolong the lives of patients. You hear about hydroxyurea, we know it improves anemia, it reduces pain, it reduces acute chest, and there's information quite clearly that those adults who have stayed on hydroxyurea are living longer than those who are not on hydroxyurea and most patients are able to tolerate hydroxyurea very well. But hydroxyurea is severely underused, not only in this country, but around the world. So here we have something that actually can prevent many problems in sickle cell disease, but we're not using it enough. And in many developing countries, it's not even available. Chronic transfusion therapy. I work in a program that probably, uh, well, I've been told by, um, by those who make apheresis equipment, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia transfuses more sickle cell patients than anywhere else uh, by apheresis. And so we sort of know the, the power of this intervention. Transfusions will improve your anemia. Uh, we know it can prevent stroke. It can reduce the frequency of acute chest for those who get recurrence. It improves growth uh, in children. And we know it's very well tolerated by uh, most uh, patients. In fact, if you follow a large number of children and you happen to have a very active TCD program that screens children to see those who are at risk for having a stroke and those who have that risk are placed on chronic transfusion therapy, you get a picture of sickle cell disease that is very different from elsewhere because you see young children who are growing up and who have absolutely no manifestations of sickle cell disease and in fact don't know what the disease is about, because much of the time they're carrying blood that is normal. More than 70% of their blood is normal. And it gives you an idea of the potential for what this intervention could do for many patients. Uh, stem cell transplantation you hear about is the only cure available, and once you're cured, you don't have sickle cell disease anymore. Okay. Now, I want to end by discussing um, a small group 
in France that have taken what we can do for sickle cell patients to the highest level that I've, I've heard of or seen anywhere. And this is a group of hospitals uh, in Cretel, uh, France, uh, who pool their information um, uh, together in managing children with sickle cell disease. So in this particular report that was published in 2011, uh, they had 217 uh, children, all of them newborn screened uh, with different types of uh, sickle cell disease, severe uh, types of sickle cell disease. And they did the same imp imp uh, infection prevention that we do here uh, with penicillin prophylaxis and vaccination. Uh, the patients were seen once every three months and they had a complete evaluation once a year. TCD, transcranial Doppler ultrasonography. The research that was done with that study uh, was done in children between two and 16 years of age. So at the end of that study, the recommendation was that we screen children uh, starting from two years of age. In, uh, in this group in France, they start at one year of age, between one and two, uh, 18 months of age. I asked them, why do you do that? They said, well, one child had a stroke waiting to get to two years of age uh, to, to get their first TCD. And they felt, therefore, they should start doing it early. Now, a pure scientist would say, oh, no, no, you haven't shown the, the value of TCD in a young age. But a public health person would say, oh, no, we don't have to wait until we understand the TCD is benign. Nobody gets hurt by having TCD. But we, if we can do it early and spot somebody who may have abnormal blood circulation, then we'll do so. And that's the approach uh, that they use here. If your study is abnormal, of course, you're placed on chronic transfusion. If it's conditional, that's the intermediate between normal and severe. They do it once uh, every three months. They also start screening all the patients with MRI and MRA to see whether there's any uh, damage uh, in the brain. As we know, many patients have what we call silent stroke. Um, so they start that at five years of age. Now, look at the interventions. They do chronic transfusion therapy for those with abnormal TCD, clearly, uh, but also those whose MRA shows that there is narrowing of blood vessels. Now, that is not really a proven indication for transfusion, if you want to be purist. But they felt that, well, having these narrowed vessels certainly places you at a risk for going on to have a stroke. So they put them on chronic transfusion. Hydroxyurea, uh, they start at three years of age for anyone who has recurrent pain or acute chest syndrome. And in addition, anybody who's hemoglobin is less than seven. That's not an indication here in this country for hydroxyurea therapy, or at least wasn't an ind indication in the research that was done. If you have abnormal TCD and the TCD becomes normal on transfusion, and your um, MRA is normal, they'll keep you on, um, they'll put you on hydroxyurea if you couldn't be maintained on transfusion. And also, they also do bone marrow transplantation if you have an identical HLA uh, match sibling. So what is the outcome? The mortality rate is 0.25 per 100 patient years, okay? So we talked about the Zarki study, 98% dying uh, by five years of age. The cooperative study in the beginning had, uh, and the Dallas uh, study says one death in maybe 200 patients. This is now one death in 400 patients followed for one year, one year. So they've doubled the survival by this intervention, okay? Another thing was that their stroke rate which is down to about 1.9% uh, in the first 18 years of life, is very low compared to 11% that we reported in the cooperative study. So when, you, when your goal is to keep patients as healthy as you can by the tools that you have, this is what you can achieve. And that's the aim in France. It's not so much to, to, char, uh, to chase the pathology as to prevent the pathology from developing. Uh, we know, as you hear, uh, about how uh, hydroxyurea is helping uh, uh, prolong life. So, whoops. So, if we talk about a hope for wellness, what can we do now to make many patients stay well? Uh, we know how to prevent early infection. We know how to prevent 
uh, acute uh, deaths related to acute anemia. Uh, we teach families how to recognize this, and we can do blood transfusions. We know how to receive, uh, to decrease frequency of severe pain. We have hydroxyurea. Of course, we have stem cell transplantation. And we know that those who are placed on chronic transfusion therapy, like the young children I talked to you about, never have any pain. They're not even aware of sickle cell pain. We know pretty much how to prevent stroke if we aggressively do our TCD, MRI screening, and use transfusion and stem cell transplantation for those we, we deem as having a risk for stroke, we will decrease their stroke incidence quite dramatically. Hydroxyurea and transfusions can help prevent acute chest syndrome, and we know also now hydroxyurea is beginning to prolong lives for those who have stayed on it. In fact, in the adult study, after following patients who were put on hydroxyurea for about 17 years when they reported, um, the death rate for, compared with those who didn't take any hydroxyurea kept decreasing the longer patients stayed on hydroxyurea. And I think out of something like 320 uh, patients who took hydroxyurea for more than 15 years, in the 17-year period of that study, none of them died. But there were five deaths um, five percent of those who didn't take hydroxyurea had died over the same period of time. So it just shows you again the power of hydroxyurea uh, in addition to preventing all of these things, uh, also saving lives. So here's my proposition, humbly, that the way we manage sickle cell disease now is to manage the pathology. We do something when something goes wrong and we even count the things that go wrong and make decisions based on it. So for instance, for a long time, the indication for giving hydroxyurea to somebody is that you should have three severe episodes of pain per year. Now how does that fit real life? You mean if I only have two, that's enough, that I can live with that, but if I have three, then you can do something to try to prevent it. That came out of a research study that just needed a way to assess the, the activity of the drug. After the research study, we should all have said that this thing can prevent pain. So why wait until people have pain or pain to a certain degree before we will help you? Doesn't make sense. So I'm saying that we need to shift our paradigm in the way we manage sickle cell disease. We need to think about keeping most people with the disease well by the tools that we have, rather than waiting until uh, they have problems. And if we did that, we could make that father happy because we'll be lifting the curse, rather than me listing all the problems that the baby would have as the baby grew up I will be trying to do something to prevent the problems from developing in the first place. So let me tell you about hemophilia. That's another disease that the same experts, hematologists, uh, mention. We classify hemophilia patients into severe, moderate, and mild. And when you are severe, we know that you will most likely have a lot of bleeding problems. Uh, but we don't say that you have to have three episodes of bad bleeding a year before we do something for you, uh, that sort of thing. We know that you have a bad disease. <clears throat> and so here is a, a statement <clears throat> made about uh, current management and diagnosis of hemophilia. It says, it starts in the middle of the sentence, so consequently, prophylaxis, that is treating hemophilia patients with the medication they need before they get sick or treating them constantly, prophylaxis has become standard of care with severe hemophilia, and it is slowly becoming standard of care for adults, uh, for children, and is becoming standard of care for adults with severe hemophilia. With the combination of lifelong prophylaxis started at an early age, along with expeditious treatment of bleeds should they occur, persons with hemophilia can now look forward to an essentially normal lifespan with good quality of life. I would just like to replace everywhere it says hemophilia with sickle cell disease, all right? So what can we do? Newborn screening and vaccination and penicillin prophylaxis we can do. 
I believe that hydroxyurea should be applied as a basic treatment, preventive treatment for people with sickle cell disease, rather than just choosing the few who already have had a lot of problems before giving them the benefit of it. And especially in developing countries where there are no intensive care units that can save the lives of people with bad acute chest, it's important that they rely mostly on preventive uh, therapy. Chronic transfusion, especially by exchange transfusion as a preferred method, when available uh, or using the simple transfusion, uh, must be applied early. And uh, that also uh, should be offered to many patients who are having uh, severe problems, particularly those who cannot uh, tolerate hydroxyurea. So the pursuit of these simple, affordable methods um, to be able to do uh, stem cell transplantation should also be encouraged. And there's a lot of research, as you hear about, that is making transplant maybe more and more possible for patients. So if we do all of this, I think we can hope for wellness everywhere. Thank you very much. Just, just a plug for these two uh, children. These are my grandchildren. And, and they are the uh, children of my son that some of you know died with sickle cell disease last year. Yep. <laughs>